Peanut the Devil is a 2015 visual novel by AVB and Mia Schwartz, where visual novels often focus on cute romances or slice-of-life comedy, this story has a distinctly more horrific tone. The novel focuses on the relationships between three queer teenagers trapped in a pseudo-religious summer camp. There's a sense of 1980s VHS nostalgia to the horror, much like the tone of Stranger Things, and a certain weirdness to the world, blithely accepted by the characters that reminds me somewhat of Twin Peaks. This is a story of social isolation and, in particular, the social isolation of queerness, to be viewed as alien and other, and what being other means in a society that views nonconformity as a fundamental, inherent evil, as original sin. For those new to the channel, I'm Sol Mattel. I talk about emotionally heavy games and other fictional works, and I am an unfortunate queer myself. I'm going to give a spoiler warning from here on in. If you want to give this strange, beautiful little game a try, I'd do so now, as this essay will discuss major plot points and character details. I promise you it's totally worth playing, especially if you're also queer. So if you're still with me, welcome, and let's journey into We Know the Devil. Before we talk about the narrative structure of the game and the specifics of its plot and characters, I want to highlight the way the game presents itself. The composer, Alec Lambert, created a dark, foreboding atmosphere for the whole piece. The soundtrack is moody and haunting. It feels disturbing, with a mix of 1980s teen horror synthetic ambiance, punctuated by moments of audio glitching intensity when the plot becomes steadily more horrific. Radio static, air raid sirens, and even a Morse code distress signal are used to great effect when our three protagonists steadily falter and fall under the influence of the titular devil. The synthetic ambiance stands in stark contrast to the organic realism of the visuals. The background art is made of real-world photos, not carefully crafted artwork, and it gives this raw, unfiltered feel in a similar manner to, say, the Blair Witch Project. The characters themselves are black and white, sketchy, and not curated in the way that many other visual novel characters tend toward being, but this gives them a unique, raw, and heavily emotional edge that allows us a closer connection more than a standard visual novel style would achieve. Finally, the game inverts the usual visual novel trips. While many other romance-led games reward players for interacting with one character the most, this game keeps track of which character has been interacted with the least, which character suffers the most rejection, and social isolation, which are, of course, the core themes of the game. The story starts us out in the summer camp, implied to be in the Midwest United States. The camp itself is hot, sticky, and mildly unpleasant in that not-quite-nostalgic way of teenage summers. Though the narration is in third person, the focus of the perspective will shift among our three protagonists throughout the story. There is a matter-of-fact, off-handed mention of the chores of the camp, which includes dealing with the literal devil in the same tone that one would use to describe cleaning a bathroom or other mundane drudgery. We meet our trio of condemned teens, Jupiter, a girl who appears to have all the characteristics of a perfect, well-rounded overachiever, but is notably extremely imperfect when it matters. Venus, a shy, socially awkward kid who seems to be the perfect target for teenage bullies, and Neptune, who appears to embody all the tropes of a generic mean girl, stereotypically attractive, aloof, cold, and texting constantly on her phone to show how much she simply does not care. Each of the trio is wearing some form of camp uniform, with a crucifix emblazoned on their lapels. Late to their evening bonfire meeting, the teens attempt to dodge out of trouble with the camp counsellor, a man known only as the Bonfire Captain. He appears to have all the trappings of a youth pastor, strumming a guitar and also wearing a crucifix on his shirt, while the teens note the smells of burning incense in the campfire, strangely noticing the sickly sense of, and I quote, ashes of monsters of the week and burned out radios, the bonfire captain begins to tell an apparently relatable parable. He talks of how, when he was a teenager, he had two friends, but secretly disliked one of them. This disliked friend got into a lot of trouble for not manning up, which the captain believes would not have happened had he simply been callous, cut the friend away, 
and quote-unquote left the rest to God, foreshadowing for the inevitable ending that one of our three protagonists may face. As the campfire burns low, he decides to send our protagonist to the isolated cabin in the far side of the woods to apparently meet the devil, punishment for their unspecified failures. The group is sent to perform checks on the sirens and fix the radios, though precisely what this means at this point is unclear. The kids treat it as a mundane task, as irritating as any other. Fixing this fictional technology requires whiskers and diodes and galenas, components of 1920s crystal detectors used in decoding radio signals. Here instead, they appear to be used as electromagnetic tripwires, rudimentary alarms to detect this apparently literal devil. It isn't long before the trio are approached by another group of teenagers, these ones sketchy, half-present, and overtly mean. It's very apparent that this is a camp for delinquents, for bad kids. What our three protagonists have done to earn such summer incarceration in a pseudo-religious reform camp like this remains an uncomfortable question to ask, and at this point, it is left unaddressed. The bullies zero in on Venus, who has frequently been zoning out, dissociating during his assigned tasks. The game presents us with our first binary choice, which two protagonists stay together, and which one moves on alone. In the first of these options, Venus and Neptune remain together while Jupiter goes to check on the next alarm station. Though Neptune moves to smart mouth them away, they don't budge. Venus, despite the verbal onslaught, holds up against the bullies, who eventually disperse by themselves. Apologetic, for how long the task has taken him, Venus stumbles over his words with Neptune, who dismisses them, and, in a strangely goading way, implies that she wishes he would fuck up on purpose. Venus remains unable to do this, adhering to social tasks and expectations of others, and admits on some level that he longs to be more like Neptune, more aloof and uncaring, though Neptune does not appreciate his benign envy. allowed to think I have it better off than you. Ever. It's the worst thing you can do. You know, sometimes I kind of envy you, Venus, and other times I kind of don't. In the second option, Venus and Jupiter leave to check on the next sirens, letting Neptune fend off the bullies herself with her natural bitchiness. Venus reflexively apologizes to Jupiter for being the target of the camp's bullies. Jupiter shrugs it off. Apologies aren't necessary for her. She tells him that her way of dealing with the camp's bullies is to play things cool with them and adopt an affable demeanor that allows her to fly under everyone's radar. She doesn't seem to feel this is a very successful strategy in general, though. It helps her dodge trouble, but it keeps her at a distance from everyone. And such distance is hardly something that makes her happy. The three teens walk onwards down the trail in the woods, towards the cabins where they are supposed to spend the night. Shoddily built and semi-dangerous, the ramshackle cabins are not somewhere any of them want to be. Venus notes that the lock on the door is broken, but this isn't a normal lock with a physical key, it's made of wire and radio components, and is not to keep out other people, but to ward off the supernatural. They treat this as a mild irritation, as if so used to questions of existential damnation that it has become their normal, daily life. Humans are much more likely to kill you than the devil is, statistically, says our narrator. Once more, we meet a binary choice. In the first, Jupiter and Venus wander through some of the other dilapidated storage shacks to find spare parts of the radio lock. They discuss the bonfire captain, and how despite his apparent favoritism for Jupiter, the one kid he never yells at, such leniency is hardly reassuring. I don't want to be the sort of person he likes. It makes me shiver. He likes people he can make a little uncomfortable, and won't give him any trouble about it. I don't think he's going to do anything terrible. No, he wouldn't, but maybe he already did. Like, you know how you don't have to touch someone to touch someone, you know? 
a microcosm of societal influences. While the bonfire captain is not overtly, violently abusive, he still uses passive coercion. He is an uncomfortable presence, even when not physically there. When not inviting his and society's scorn, the pressure for conformity remains, and that pressure is destructive and painful. In the second choice, Jupiter and Neptune explore the inside of the shacks and find the one last piece of furniture which hasn't decayed entirely, though external appearances are deceptive. Internally rotted, it falls apart as soon as Jupiter touches it. She feels a sense of guilt over this, of inadvertently always being somehow wrong. Neptune, angry at Jupiter's self-loathing, tells her to never admit it, never get herself in trouble, or to give in to the unpleasant people like the bonfire captain. You're so chill about everyone's bullshit. It makes me so mad. And then you won't even extend the slightest of that chill to yourself. And that makes me even so madder. Can you be just a little less good? In a subtle form of self-harm, Jupiter snaps a hairband against her wrist, a coping mechanism for her self-hatred. Neptune holds her and silently a sense of touch of ethereal hands forms between them. Though who owns these ethereal hands is yet to be revealed. The night rolls in, and the group, bored out of their minds, decide to play the eternal adolescent game of truth or dare. Jupiter and Venus hesitate, but still engage regardless. Neptune, as ever the one to goad the others into misbehavior, begins coughing, as if there is mucus or ichor stuck in the back of her throat. Regaining her composure, she returns with a vengeance, determined to at least see one of her companions play. The choices return. In the first, Neptune picks Venus, who wilts under her stern gaze, and immediately picks Dare. Neptune questions this, when stuck in a camp filled with people making him do dangerous things he doesn't particularly want to do, why would he extend that out with a dare, particularly one picked by the capricious Neptune? His response, though, is interesting. To be truthful is humiliating, and to be humiliated is worse than to risk being hurt in a dare. He continues to hide himself and shies away further when Neptune suggests her dare should be humiliating, including the somewhat on the nose idea of making him run around the camp in women's clothes. A dare, perhaps, uncomfortably close to an underlying truth. Continuing her apparently corrupting temptations, Neptune is caught in a coughing fit, Iker once more choking up her voice. She finally settles on a playful, yet merciful dare. Venus must stop apologizing for himself for the rest of the night. As subtle as this seems, this remains important. Venus, hiding and ashamed, is constantly apologetic for what he is at his core. Neptune wants him to be unapologetic, taking quite literal pride in his identity and not guilt for his existence. You shouldn't have to apologize for things you don't have to apologize for. Sorry. Whoops. In the next choice, Neptune picks Jupiter immediately and pointedly asking who she has a crush on. Jupiter stammers and hesitates, though before she can fully answer, Neptune cuts her off and moves on to a different question, implying she already knows the answer. She comments that she can't imagine Jupiter fawning over some dude, again, perhaps somewhat on the nose. When pressed further, Jupiter continues to dodge the question, stating she'd date anyone who wanted to pursue her, an answer that has no commitment to no definitive revelation, but still offers an invitation. She goes further, implying that Venus would have a crush on Neptune instead, as he has a quote-unquote good taste. While this is not true, it's certainly still a way for Jupiter to comment on her own attractions without directly saying it. A delicate dance, a feather-light touch by someone who cannot speak truth aloud and can only talk in implication. The next hour rolls along, the siren alarms buzzing louder as the night falls. Primed and alert, but not triggered. The narration offhandedly mentions, even a kid can kill the devil. All she has to do is try. The trio discuss leaving the cabin to make the rounds, to check that the devil hasn't tripped any of the alarms. 
They take their radio devices with them, the one weapon they have against the supernatural. None of them want to. With the potential threat of the bonfire captain possibly checking up on them hanging over their heads, the sirens start to blare their unmistakably horrific note. They decide two of them to check the alarms, leaving one to stay to guard the cabin. In the first of the three choices, Jupiter stays in the cabin while Neptune and Venus check the perimeters. The narration once more returns, don't walk off the path, keep the lights on, don't let the devil into your heart. Neptune and Venus speak about Jupiter in her absence. Do you think she hates us? It's not even her fault she's at the Summer Scouts, like it's ours. Venus, can you shut up? Please? Jupiter doesn't hate anyone. She's like an aesthetic monk and not given a shit. They continue to talk more. Neptune clearly worries for Jupiter, and worries how much she is repressing, though in lieu of comfort and restraint, her solution is far more... Radical. No one is that invincible. If it hurts, you should say so. People are supposed to get hurt by things. It's fucked up to not. It's like, it's not good for you. You too, Venus. Have a little more self-respect. I know that. It's not like I'm stupid, you know. I worry about her too, you know. Don't you at least want to make things a little easier for her? No. I want to make it worse. I want to make it so bad she has to say it. I want to hear it out loud. Neptune, ever the temptress, desires only for Jupiter to shed her shame, her guilt, her self-loathing. And if she has to accelerate the suffering just to push Jupiter into finally accepting the truth about her latent identity, that is what she will do. As calm as Jupiter appears on the surface, her companions instinctively know there's more that lies beneath. And she denies herself closeness to others, neither in touch with them nor herself. In the second choice, Neptune and Jupiter leave the cabin whilst Venus stays behind. The girls talk about him, unsure exactly what to make of him. Are you seriously worried about him? Maybe. A little. He is weird. Not in a bad way, necessarily. But maybe in a bad way, possibly. Sometimes I don't even know what he is. Venus, for all his apparent timid nature, is still also hiding a latent identity. One that he doesn't want seen around anyone else. But as the two others with the devil snaking around their hearts, Jupiter and Neptune can still see right through him. There are some things that you can't hide forever. In the third choice, Neptune remains in the cabin. Venus and Jupiter exit, though they speak more of themselves than they do of Neptune. Venus talks of how often he allows himself to get into trouble by going along with what others tell him to, including bullies with bad intentions like Group South, the bullies we encountered earlier. Jupiter talks of how she, too, goes along with what is expected of her, often without really understanding. My mom doesn't believe thinking things out is something you can teach. To her, you either get it or you don't. And until then, you should just shut up and do the right thing instead of looking like an idiot. They contemplate how Neptune would never engage in such passivity, how her devil may care of rebelliousness is perhaps, actually, the better path. And of course, the devil deeply cares. The group all return to the cabin together. Jupiter and Venus start becoming nervous, and Neptune points out that such anxiety is sure to bring the devil down upon them. This does not help. Now exasperated, she brings out a way to drown such fears, a bottle of poor quality alcohol that she'd smuggled in, and she brings out two shot glasses. In the first choice, she drinks with Venus, gently bullying him into accepting the temptation. They drink together and barely hold down the nauseating vodka. Quickly becoming intoxicated, they merrily argue, Venus telling Neptune that her true problem is that she hates herself. Neptune, entirely nonplussed, blithely admits that this is true of her 
and everyone else in the world and shrugs off the chap. She begins her retort, telling Venus what his true problem is, but is interrupted by the bile and ichor again building in her throat. Coughing and retching, she rushes to the bathroom. Venus goes with her to hold her hair back, though notes how she's vomited far more than just the alcohol she's drank. The devil's bile is already in her, though neither she nor Venus will admit it. Venus promises not to reveal this embarrassment to Jupiter. Neptune promises she'll be entirely better by the morning, but the situation remains uncomfortable for them both. Despite the discomfort, they finally give each other some measure of honesty. Venus, your problem is that you are very nice. That you want something. That you think being nice is going to give it to you. But it never will. And until you figure out what it is you want, every kindness of yours will be full of that want. Like mine is. Your problem, Neptune, is you think being mean's more honest, but you're just as bad as Jupiter. Or me. In the second choice, Neptune shares her alcohol with Jupiter, who barely takes any persuasion to drink it. She barely remains tipsy and reveals that her parents let her have small amounts of alcohol on Sundays. Neptune and Venus, by comparison, become drunk far quicker. Whilst talking about her parents, Jupiter also reveals that her father doesn't like women, not in any misogynistic sense, but implies that he has no real sexual nor romantic interest in them. Neptune is confused as to why a gay man would send his daughter to a religious camp. However, Jupiter implies that this is to placate her more strict mother. She remains vague on any further details of her family life. In this route, Neptune once more starts to cough and splutter, though in this instance, holds back the bile, begging Jupiter not to look. She barely keeps her composure. She, too, wishes to keep her darker, quote-unquote, disgusting side hidden, but especially from someone that she deeply admires, or even loves. As midnight rolls around, the trio finish off the bottle of paint-stripping vodka. Neptune suggests that they play another game, as they've already played Truth or Dare. Venus drunkenly suggests seven minutes in heaven, but seems to immediately regret it. Jupiter, finally also drunk, declares that it is her turn first. In the first choice, she picks Venus. They enter the darkened closet together, giving them both a chance at more honesty. Only speaking in a roundabout halfway nature, they both admit their knowledge. The growing attraction between Jupiter and Neptune is present, and something that Venus is aware of and trying to help foster. They both understand that Venus is not like the other boys, too. Whilst most other boys tend towards being angry or overtly abrasive when presented with hardship, Venus remains different. What about you, then? I'm mad about a lot of things, I guess. You're not mad. You're jealous. Why are you so jealous? It's flattering, but it's weird. The hints at Venus's latent identity are becoming more overt, but still not enough that someone without the knowledge of hidden queerness would be able to necessarily identify it. In a moment of frustration, Jupiter snaps her hair tie around her wrist, again mimicking self-harm, and ghostly hands seem to appear and squeeze around Venus's throat. Though they vanish just as soon as they appear, Jupiter remains fearful and guilty, somehow knowing that it's her fault, the fault of the devil inside her. In the second choice, Jupiter picks Neptune. The two become close, their bodies press up against one another, and they admit their truth with touch, without words. It's not real if you don't say it out loud, right? That... that's right. No one can prove it. No one except us. It's your word against mine. A double lock. So, it never happened unless we both say it did. Some things can't be taken back. There are things worse than saying it directly, you know? 
Like, this feels right. And I'm just so happy. I'm not saying them. There are things anybody could have said about anybody. They're just in the air. The Midwest is great. All you have to do is not say it out loud. Even at the climax of their affections, everything remains hidden and shrouded in their own secrecy. Neither can be open about themselves or their desires, and anything they do together is something that can never be open or seen by anyone else. They hardly even admit the truth to one another, even at the moment of their greatest vulnerability together. In the darkness, Jupiter's invisible hands touch, clasp, longing, and wanting. In her, the devil is far more often gentle than it is harsh. As the clock moves past midnight, the sirens continue their buzz. The captain's radio picks up a crackling static, and the trio use their own radios to boost its signal, coiling the components around one another, lightning internal incense. Technology and religious ritual continue to blend here as one. To complete the ritual, Venus needs more copper wire. One of them must leave to fetch it whilst the other two stay. In the first choice, Jupiter leaves, and Venus and Neptune remain. Venus discusses their lives at the camp, how everyone else seems to be bullying them. He asks why it doesn't bother Neptune, who seems to just let it all wash over her. I'm an evil bad slut, right? I'm a bitch and a flirt. I'm a bitch because I let people know when they walk over me. I'm a flirt because boys keep talking at me. And this is somehow my problem because they won't leave me alone? How is that fair? Why should I get hurt by that? It makes me so mad. Why would I be anything but mad about all this stupid, obnoxious bullshit? Venus, in turn, admits that he cannot get mad and still listens to the social and religious message of turn the other cheek, though this has done nothing but let him get hurt more and more through his life. As much as Neptune remains the temptress and encourages him to actually feel his emotions, she once more admits that he is entirely unlike the other boys in the camp. Whatever the reason, she encourages him to keep it up. In the second choice, Neptune leaves to the wiring as Jupiter and Venus remain in the cabin. Venus at last admits his underlying feelings, his burning, barely contained anger at being abandoned by the other scouts, at being neglected by their families, at being society's scapegoats. Right, try hard. Not everyone in the normal scouts tried all that hard, you know. Do you think everyone in the scouts tried harder than you ever have? If it's true, it's true. But if even one person who didn't try as hard as you got more than you, you have to say it isn't fair. Doesn't it feel unfair? It's just reality. It's reality on purpose. Reality is someone's fault. He continues to express his anger at the inequality of the world, revealing why he remains so otherwise passive throughout the narrative. When someone rigs it from the start and then says, try your best, doesn't that make you mad? Doesn't that make you so impossibly mad that you never want to try at all? I don't know what's wrong with me, but I can't budge. Not when it comes to this. Whatever they want out of me that's not fixing radios. To be tougher? To grow up? To... Wait, what was that? Before Venus can finish his thought, he is interrupted by visions of shimmering bright lights, the same dissociative will-o'-the-wisps that he has encountered before, his hidden anger every time he is told to be a man betrays the presence of the devil within him. As the trio approach the early hours of the morning, the devil finally comes to visit, and instead of the common visual novel or romance genre trope of pairing off the characters that have been interacted with the most and giving the player their happy ending, the game instead keeps track of which character has been interacted with the least, which one suffers the social isolation, which one is the scapegoat, which one is just that little bit worse than the others. That lonesome girl will be the one most vulnerable to the call of the devil, and she will be the one most likely to fall. The trio, 
Having finally gathered enough components to repair the cabin radio and try to tune in to God, their one hope of salvation, instinctively they begin to pray, ritualized words burned into their minds, even though they all know that the prayer itself does nothing to help. God remains static, constantly on 108.9 FM, a single prescribed signal for everyone to find. The devil, on the other hand, is constantly shifting in the spaces between signals, never in the same place twice, whilst it is easy to walk the path of the rigid light. To walk in the dark is to walk the unknown. They find God, and God delivers his parable, threatening and judgmental, sounding like quote-unquote every boy you're afraid of, talking at once. And at last, God speaks. God, synonymous for patriarchy, for power, the rule of social hierarchy, and society's every ill judgment against those it casts out. Each of you shall choose. It is certain that the devil is coming. It is certain. It is absolutely certain that the devil is already here. Parables 1-1. The devil is only the shadow of man. From the light of God. The meaning of this parable is that there is no devil. The devil is only the shadow of man cast from the light of God. The devil isn't some external evil force, the devil is us. The parts of ourselves we hide too ugly, too unwanted by external society. The devil is the edges of ourselves we cut off in order to fit in, and everything we were told we cannot be. Everything we repress. But not everything can be repressed forever. The three girls gather around each other, terrified, despairing, angry, each convinced that they are the devil, and everything is about to happen is in fact their own fault. And so, each of them fall. Also vanity to be seen and to see. The human eye sees clearly by the light of God, but the devil by his own light. And thus sees only his own truth. The meaning of the parable. The first fallen girl I shall talk about is Venus, and from here on in I shall use her correct pronouns. I apologize for misgendering her previously in this video, though I feel that it is the only way necessary to give the sense of progression of her character from uncertain adolescent to brave woman. The Will of the Wisps return, but this time Jupiter and Neptune can see them too. The lights hover in the sky and they slowly enter the cabin, and the devil is here. The trio run. Sprinting through the forest, Neptune and Jupiter do their best to protect Venus, but it's no use. Lost in the darkness of the trees, all the devil wants is her. Venus. The kid who wants to hide. The devil's lights claim her, and stars in her eyes. She finally becomes herself. The devil incarnate. The temptations, the hidden ugliness, the latent soul hidden beneath the socially polite surface. Everything she has tried to hide, finally comes shining through, her gender at last truly revealed. Why? Why wouldn't you let it have me? I don't want to be strong, I don't want to be that sort of person at all. The lights at the edge of my eyes, I want to see them so much. They're so horrible. I can't look away. I want them within and without me, all through and about me. I want feathers in my lungs and eyes and my skin. I want my heart to see and my lungs to fly. Becoming an angel embodied, Venus burns in the light, a seraphim with a thousand wings and a thousand eyes, the body horror of the devil changing and twisting and warping her. It's horrific, it's disgusting, and yet, it's beautiful. In her conclusion, she can see and be seen. Jupiter and Neptune cover their faces, instinctively staying closer to the side of God than that of the devil, and try to exorcise the devil in Venus, and alas... She loses herself in the process. 
and the devil only gets one moment for revenge, for love, for please see me. Venus comes so close, but without the support of her peers, she has the devil burned out of her. For just a moment, she was almost, almost able to live her truth, to be honest about who she is and not have to lie about her existence, her very nature, the core of her identity. But as the devil fades, she returns to her old life, hidden, covered. Her thousand eyes closed forever. No one is going to see the true her ever again. Thanks to God's grace. The dawn finally arrives. Venus remains stuck halfway up a tree, the vapor of the devil burning off in the morning sun. Neptune and Jupiter, now alone with one another, lean on each other and become just that little bit closer. But Venus, without the devil, remains lost and incomplete, her edges clipped away to suit society's expectations of her, to grow up, to be a man, to be tough, to be everything she does not want to be. It's a bad end. A method for the extraction of bile. Create an incision on the middle finger. All of the water of the body can be thought of as a single ocean, as one drop. And extract the resulting ink. Place in a vial and explain to it the worthlessness of the treasures of Earth. Break it against a mirror, the cause of the vanity. The next girl whose fall I will discuss is Neptune, who will bring the world down with her. As the trio slowly come to realize that the devil is in Neptune, she denies there is any problem, brushing off their concerns despite coughing and spluttering, the Icor once more choking up her throat, excusing herself to the bathroom to throw up again, a scene that is darkly reminiscent of teenage bulimia, she begs the others to let her be. Worried for her safety, Jupiter and Venus follow on. After she's stayed in there far, far too long, they ask her to open up the door, and what comes out is a cursed, damaged version of Neptune, dripping with devil-stained fluid. Just as she was before the devil took her, Neptune immediately pins Venus to the wall to continue her quote-unquote corruption, but this time forcibly without Venus's consent. She forces her ichor down Venus's throat, all the while claiming it's for their own good. Jupiter, panicking, tries to shove her away, but with the strength of the devil behind her, Neptune is immovable. You kids are trying so hard to be good. And I guess I don't want you to. Doesn't it feel unfair? You're already good. So why do you have to try so hard to be good? It makes me mad. They want you to prove you're good. But you're already so, so good. Good. What is that? Why do they do that? It makes me mad. It makes me so, so mad. When Jupiter tries to stop her, she remains determined. What the world sees as corruption, she sees as liberation. She continues trying to push Venus to unleash the devil in Venus too and rebukes Jupiter's attempts to stop her. Does that kid look happy to you? Well, I guess we have different opinions. And you will have to stop me from making him into what he's trying very hard not to be. And Jupiter... I want to do the same to you so badly. So, so badly. I don't want to be good, ever. And neither of you should want to be either. Converting the standard line between 
good and evil. Good to Neptune only means rigid societal conformity and the slow death of the self in the process. Bad means giving into temptation, yes, but it's also the only way to live any form of truth, to have any form of freedom or any form of authentic life. But in this ending, much like in Venus's ending, the others don't give in. Neptune alone remains with her words unheard and her temptations unheeded. They deny her what she wants, choosing not to let her set them free. And the devil only ever gets one moment. For revenge, for desire, for please think of me. They wash the devil out of Neptune, and the next morning it drains slowly, drip by drip, as she lies unconscious. The stain of the devil flows into the lake to be swept away like poison down a drain. Venus and Jupiter speak, fearful of what has happened and glad that it wasn't them as they watch Neptune dream. Neptune herself forms no words, unable to communicate, unable to tempt further. The devil is entirely out of her, and so the truth she was trying to lead them all towards remains buried. She lost. discuss is Jupiter, and her fall is a quiet, harsh thing. By the time the radio is done talking, the others already know. They can feel the unseen hands, the invisible fingertips of Jupiter's devil touch. We can feel it. It's like a moth flapping its wings, but I can feel fingers on my face and arms and everywhere. Gross. I'm gross. I feel so distant. When did it happen? Feels like just a few hours ago, everything was fine. This always happens. I always do this. Every time, I'm so stupid. Don't touch me. You shouldn't touch me. I wasn't born good. Distrusting herself, and distrusting her own desires, Jupiter believes in her own irredeemable original sin. Taught that her desires, her sexuality, and deep facets of her core make her lost and broken, she understands that the front she puts on for others is worthless. God knows her, and God can judge her heart, and by all the standards of God, all the standards of adult society, all the standards of everything they try to impose on her, she knows in her heart that she is wrong. She longs for touch, she longs for intimacy, but believing she is inherently evil, she knows that she cannot and should not have it. Venus and Neptune try to offer comfort, saying that they don't care if she believes she's tainted, that they'll still love her regardless, but Jupiter is far too gone to accept. You are sweet, but don't do that. I won't be happy if you do, and I won't let you. It's wrong to want such a thing. You know that, don't you? So don't do it. I still know that much. Stop looking up to me. I want to touch. I want to be touched. I want to hurt. I want to be hurt. And if you feel the same way, you're as bad as me. Far from running away, like in Venus's conclusion, Jupiter gives in to touch she could never have, to the hands, the desire she wants but cannot fulfill. The others remain in the cabin with her, sympathetic to her, but ultimately have to bring out their radios and exorcise the devil from her. They choose to remain distant, to err on the side of God, to deny Jupiter her touch, and the devil only gets one moment for revenge, for love, for please take me back. 
the devil is blown away from Jupiter. The others stay with her as she lies peacefully on the cabin floor. They both wonder why it wasn't them instead. Neither Neptune nor Venus believe that Jupiter was the worst of them. She was the least worst kid, the one that was able to bury her feelings the deepest, the one that, at the moment of the devil taking her, begged them to start the exorcism. They look down at her, though Neptune advises they stop this train of thought. After all, as the two survivors of encountering the devil, arguing with each other over which of them is more self-hating, achieves nothing. Especially when the most self-hating of the three is lying on the floor, unconscious and barely recovering. Jupiter never fully gives in to the devil as much as she wants to. Even at her worst, she has still internalized God's social laws, reminding her how wrong her needs are. She remains trapped in her hedgehog's dilemma, desiring touch, desiring intimacy so badly, but guilting herself quite literally to hell and back for even having such feelings at all. What's ugly isn't that we had to choose one of us to be the scapegoat. What's ugly is that we have to choose it all. As sad and fundamentally depressing as the other endings may have been, there is still one more ending, a secret ending, in which no one is left out. No one girl is the worst, but they all go down together. This time, they retune the radio, but instead of finding God and God's judgement, they find the devil. Oh. Hi there. Oh, darling. I miss you. I have always missed you. I can still remember what your faces were like. I have missed them since before you were born. Please come back. I know I can't offer much. The bodies I can give you are weak. The stories I tell are... impossible. My world is even more precarious than this one. But please, come back. It hurts to see you like this. So unhappy in these bodies of yours. Stricken by those stories. Forced to live in so much pain. I can't even come save you. But I can promise one thing. There is room for three in my world, and only two in his. This time, no one gets left behind. Panicking, Jupiter and Venus try to console themselves. They fear that because they transformed into the devil, the other scouts will come and banish it from them. That they'll wake up the next day, exercised and back to quote unquote normal. Neptune box at any concept of returning to who they used to be. The devil has been far more accepting and loving with them than anything God ever provided. She argues with Jupiter, chastising her further, asking why Jupiter wants to so desperately meet the arbitrary moral standards of bad people who will never accept them anyway. People like the other scouts, or the bonfire captain, or their parents, or overall wider society, anyone else at all that hurt them. Jupiter blaming herself for being a bad kid, hardly notices when Venus finds the devil, so caught up in trying to martyr herself for the cause of remaining good. Venus declares that she herself is the devil, and proceeds to tear her own arm off. The body horror returns, but this time it's strangely bloodless, strangely wholesome. She sheds her old masculine form. She doesn't need it anymore. It's like... I didn't realize how much my body was bothering me all this time before. And when it's peeled off, it just it, it finally feels like I don't have to think about it so much. Like I'm normal. This time, changing by volition, without coercion, Venus starts to become whole. Her body starts to make sense to her. She completes her transition and her pronouns change within the text to reflect this. Neptune, already entirely on board with the devil, takes no persuasion to stay on the side of darkness. 
Jupiter, however, has her doubts, still holds herself back, desperate to meet the standards expected of her, desperate to be good. Not stupid. I know Camp and the Captain and everyone is messed up, but what else do you expect me to do? I want to leave this camp, this state, this planet, but I can't. I just can't. It's like a reflex. I can't stop it. Let's go back before it's too late. It's only when Neptune gently takes her hand, gives her the touch that she so sorely needs, that Jupiter finally starts to come around. Did you know I hate this place? I hate it so much, and everyone who says I'm pretty just makes me hate it more. Jupiter, we could still go back, but if you try to make me, I'll kill you. Don't make us have to keep these bodies we hate. Don't make us go back to those people. Don't make us go home. And I won't let you do that to yourself either. Neptune, ever the temptress, and now ever the protectress, does what she can to stop Jupiter from self-sabotaging at her moment of self-actualization. Despite coming so close to fully, finally accepting herself and embracing the devil, Jupiter still has doubts. You just... You just make me? Do you want it to not be your fault? Do you want me to make you so it doesn't have to be your responsibility? That's sweet. No, I'm not. I won't do that for her. She has to say yes. That's also kind of sweet. Unlike in her lonely devil form, Neptune this time doesn't offer force or coercion, but offers support and love. Jupiter has to accept, has to consent for herself. Sometimes it's scary to take that first step, to take responsibility and claim agency for your own self and own life, when previously God and society may have dictated it for you. It's easy to accept your prescribed role, even if it's killing you. It's hard and terrifying to forge your own path, but with bravery, Jupiter finally accepts the support of her friends and finally embraces her devil. Promise me hell is right there, right behind that door, all of it. Promise, really promise that there's no going back. Promise me there's no chance, okay? If I taste what it's like, I know there's no way I'll be happy being human ever again. If I have to be in my old body again, I'll die. So if you also promise that I won't ever have it again, what I will promise you is I won't drag you down. I'll stop thinking you're so cool. I won't envy ever again. I promise. When you say you are fine, I will never stop yelling at you until you stop lying. Their devil's transformation is complete. However, this time the body horror is something calmer, slower, far more caring. Together, the three girls meld themselves to one another, embracing and accepting each other, giving unrestrained love. Venus's faltering old body falls away, leaving her soul to become the many-eyed, many-winged angel she always was. Jupiter's aversion and fear to touch melts away as she accepts the closeness and love of her friends. Neptune, no longer infused with such anger, runs as a clear flood, there to help, there to heal, with all the patience in the world. In this final version of the ending, the devil's not lonely, the odd one out, the one queer, weird girl isn't lonesome and cast away. There is nothing to fear when there are two against the devil, but we can't wait to see what they'll do against the three worst girls since Eve. In the final epilogue, the three supernatural girls embrace who they are and bring their gift of transformation and of acceptance to the rest of the entire camp. Far more at peace, they set the world to rights allowing love to shine through in the end. Not even the bonfire captain can stop them. No one can. They slowly plan to show their transformations, their temptations, to every other wayward team that gets sent to their camp, 
not to re-educate or to convert them, as the bonfire captain may have tried to do, but to accept them and love them for whatever they are. The feeling that we know the devil elicits is one of uncertainty, vague half-understanding and a background sense of anxiety. The elements of its world-building are often left unexplained and threadbare at best, hearkening back to the tropes of its narrative origins, the ghost story and the gothic horror. Audience imagination is allowed to fill in many of the blanks. The technology and the religious rituals paint a picture of a weird, confusing and scary world that neither we nor our main characters can really understand. After all, how do incense sticks and ashes of monsters of the week fit in with radio contraptions, and how do these exercise a very literal devil? It instead far more focuses on humanizing its characters, but even then, many of the conversations that they have are subtle. Things are spoken around whilst never being spoken directly of, a relatable occurrence for any queer teenager, or at least a relatable experience for me. In places where it's dangerous to be too honest or too open about yourself and your identity, speaking in code becomes the norm. Gothic horror has often been used as a method of talking about the strange, the terrifying, and the other. Societies that viewed queer identity as inherently other and inherently somehow bad often use horror as the main means of exploring queer identities. We Know the Devil continues this tradition that started with the works of queer relationships of Carmilla, or the body horror sexuality of the great god Pan, but now from the perspective of the stranger, from the queer other themselves. The horror now, therefore, isn't the twisting or the warping of bodies, or the unusual acts of queer sexuality, or the expression of identity. The horror is instead seen in the act of forcing oneself to fit a social mold that does not fit. The horror is in the act of making yourself acceptable to others by trimming your own wings. It's the act of assimilation. It's the act of obeying God. All of these things are a slow suicide. It is only by embracing the strange, the terrifying, and the other can any latently queer adolescent, or adult for that matter, truly become free. God is not fair, and nor is society. In this world, we know that the law of God demands a hierarchy, and whenever there is hierarchy, someone has to be at the bottom. Much like the real world, this is designed to allow those at the top to retain power, and forces those below to fight each other instead. God's laws and society's laws, be they legal code or the rules of etiquette, have been designed to keep rigid order and beat down the strange, the other, and the queer, encouraging those on the bottom to tear up each other so that someone else can be the scapegoat of the day and hit rock bottom. In a story beat that subtly nods towards queer inviting, it's notable that in three of the four endings, two of the characters team up against the other. One is left out, one is isolated, and one is made to be the scapegoat for the devil, the things the kids can point to and blame for all the social problems. Even if you're a filthy queer, so long as you can say, someone else is worse than me, you might climb the ladder for yet another day. We see this often enough in the real world too, time and again, with uh, Milo Yemenemenemenem's uh, Blarch White and uh, Calvin Grove Garage Band being some of the most prominent recent examples. Even within more progressive queer circles, internal bullying is still rife. Myself and my co-authors have all suffered from being the scapegoats of our peers, whether in quote-unquote normal straight society or within queer groups, many of which can be just as vicious. Hierarchy and social capital never quite go out of fashion anywhere, it seems. When two of our characters exercise the devil out of the third, it is still an inauthentic act, a lie. We as the audience know the devil is inside all of them. It always was. It doesn't matter if they choose to give in to the temptation or not, it is part of their hidden identities. Avoiding being the devil today is just postponing the inevitable. Self-loathing and inauthentic performances only highlight that sacrificing others is an act done out of fear and desperation for some morsel of societal acceptance. It's neither an act of justice, nor is it an act of self-love. The three girls were always fallen from God's grace. All they had to do was admit it. We Know the Devil 
stands as a story about facing yourself, honestly, truly, and in full knowledge of who you are. It's about seeing yourself and all your quote-unquote awfulness, all your flaws, all the parts you loathe, all the parts society has taught you are bad and tainted and wrong, and choosing to embrace yourself despite that. It's about seeing every unchangeable, irredeemable aspect of who you are, and making the choice to accept yourself and cherish those parts. It is a choice that requires the bravery to take responsibility for yourself, your identity, and your own happiness. If the devil is in the other, then we are all the devil, for none of us are perfect in God's light, and God, of course, leaves no room for error. It's only in our apparent flaws, in the queerness and strangeness of ourselves, that we are taught to despise, that we can find out who we really are. Sometimes, the answer is to see all those things, and to choose to love yourself regardless, aggressively, with passion, determination, and pride. Like Neptune, I would see us all go down with the devil. There is more truth in what we are scared of about ourselves than there is in an inauthentic social performance, especially for a society that condemns us for sins of being human, for being queer, for being emotionally hurt, or for just being different. There is no happiness in assimilation. There is no joy in self-denial. There is no redemption in the eyes of an unforgiving God. There is only salvation in self-acceptance, and between God and the devil, I know which one would welcome my own queerness with open arms. Thank you all for watching to the end of this video. I'd also like to give a very, very big special thanks to AVB and Neo Schwartz for writing this wonderful visual novel. And if you haven't gathered by my cosplay, I am a fan of your other works too. I'd also like to give a very special thanks to Ash, uh, Voice Quills, uh, Balsam, and uh, Skylar Zine for providing some of the wonderful vocals in this, as well as Mousy and uh, Codex Entry for providing some of the secondary vocals too. Thank you both so, so much. So, I am continuing to make videos, I promise. I know it's been a very long time since I released very much, but we will be getting back to regular viewing soon. We have a very, very long video on Nice Field Republic 2 that is going to be airing cross fingers soon. I'd also like to give a very special thanks to all of my wonderful, lovely patrons and backers who have been helping me throughout this time. But this particular thanks to Daniela Alvarez, Alex Shemp, I am so sorry I mispronounced your name the last time, uh, Crushable Door, Sarah Grammer, and Chad Horton. If you want to become a patron of this channel and help me continue on producing wonderful little videos like this one, the uh, link to the patrons down in the doobly doo there as well. I have also made a little visual novel of my own, which is quite similar to this sort of one in style and in contact. It's quite gay, it's quite trans, check it out if you like. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time. That'll do.